Sippler is a tool for removing unwanted directionally oriented detail from an image. For example, hair, scars, tears, wrinkles, image artifacts or other things of that nature. And rather than going in and showing the tool right away, I thought I'd take some time to explain the underlying concept and sort of the method driving the tool. It's a concept I like to call guided low frequency filtering. Normally when we do frequency separation, we apply a blur to the image to get the low frequency detail. And then we divide or minus that with the original plate to get the high frequency detail. And that means that we have a stream of high frequency detail and a stream of low frequency detail that we can manipulate individually. So for example, like here, where we can blur the low frequency detail. However, one thing I realized is that we don't necessarily need to just have a regular Gaussian blur here. We can also use a directional blur. So if we change the blur type from zoom to linear, you can see that as we increase the blur length, we kind of get more and more of the original image back. And that's due to the fact that the difference between the original plate and the directional blur one is quite significant. And there's like no detail that matches the original plate. So the high frequency stream will contain most of the detail. Now, if we focus our attention to an area like here. So as I start to change the angle here, you can see that I start to get a bit of ghosting. Now let me reduce the blur angle and let's see what happens when the blur angle starts to align with the sort of angle of the hair here. And now you can see the hair has completely disappeared. And the reason is that if you blur from here to here, you have sort of the same white color going all the way across through. So when you blur it, you kind of just get sort of uh, the same line. And so the difference between the original plate and the blurred one is much smaller. And that means that we can isolate this once we start to dividing it by the original plate. So as you see, we only really fix this part of the plate. The rest kind of have this a little bit of a curve to it. And that means that the directional blur won't really help us there. And so the question is, how can we make a tool that lets the artist define a path that nuke should blur along? And out of the box, there isn't really any tool that does that. So we need to create our own. Now, one of the ways we can do that is by using a roto brush. Now, if we look at this isolated and we take a look at what happens here, you can see that we go from a high luminance to a low luminance. And that means that we have sort of a direction going this way. And over here, it's going a little bit that way. And over here, it's going this way. And so to visualize what's going on, let's create a vector visualizer. So let's start by creating an expression node and set the first output to red, green, and blue. If we put X into this, we get the X numeric value. You can see the X position is the one that's in the red, blue, and the green value. If we set this to Y, it's the Y position that's in the red, blue, and the green channel. What we can do is we can use a modular operation. So if we type X modular 10, what you can see is that it will go from zero all the way up to nine then back to zero, all the way up to nine, then back to zero, all the way up to nine. And that gives sort of these stripe patterns. We can do the same for the Y axis. And that gives these horizontal lines. Now, if we put this inside of parentheses and use a Boolean operation, the exclamation mark that will turn all things that are zero, you know, all the black parts will be turned into white. Then we multiply that by the same thing in the X axis. So now we have a dot every 10 points. We can of course change this to 20 or 30 or anything we like, but we just keep it at 10. Next up, we're going to calculate our vectors. So we split this off and create a matrix node. Set it to three by three, put it into the roto paint node, set it to one to one, minus one, minus two, minus one, and only apply this to the red channel. Now, if we create a grade node and offset it, you can see that all the things that are facing in this direction is bright and all the things that are facing in other ways are dark. And now we create another three by three matrix, this time for the green channel. Set it to minus one, minus two, minus one, one, two, one. And now you can see everything that is facing this direction is bright and everything that's facing in this direction is dark. The blue channel is still unaffected, so we're just going to add a grade node, make sure that it's the blue and the alpha channel and turn the gain down to zero. And then we're going to normalize the values. I'm just going to add a point vector math ops. But you can use whatever normalized tool you have. Now we're going to shuffle that into a dot grid. Apply a vector blur. Set the UV channels to motion. Set the motion fall off to one. Just for visualization purposes, I'm going to create a grade and turn that up. Going back to the vector blur, so now you can see as I start to increase the motion amount, you can see the direction that these vectors are facing. So they're facing this direction, this direction, this direction, and this direction. 
However, what you can also see is that in the center here, there's a black spot. The reason is if we look back at our rotor shape, you can see that when we go from here, it goes from zero all the way up to one. And then from here to here, it's one all across. So there is no directionality in the center of the stroke. And the reason is that the hotness is set to 0 0.2 and we need to set that down to zero. And now when we apply a rotor brush and look at the center, it goes from zero all the way to one, where one is in the center and then goes back down again. So in the only place where there's no real directionality is sort of in the core center here. So now when we look at our vector visualizers, you can see that the points are moving all the way to the middle. Uh, we still have some issues in the very dead center, but that's not too much of a problem once we start to apply the blur. This, however, is not the right direction we want to blur in. We don't want to blur it in this direction, we want to blur it in this direction. So what we can do is that we can rotate the rectus. And the most simple way to do that would be to add a axis node and a color matrix node. If you look at what happens when I start to rotate around the C-axis here, you can see that these four parameters here, they start to change. So if I pipe those into the color matrix node, now I can control the direction of the vectors by changing the C-axis here. In our case, 90 is just perfect. And now you can sort of see that the vectors are moving along the stroke here. Another way of doing it is just thinking about the vectors. Normally we have the uh, X vector and we have the Y vector. If we flip those two around, so in the x vector we put the y vector, and in the y vector we put the x vector, and now they're sort of turning inside out, so if we just flip one of those, they will sort of align perpendicular with the original vector. And that is exactly what we need. So rather than using our dots here, let's put the original plate back in. So now when I do the brush, you can see that I blur along the stroke. I can also do it with a bit more precision by using the open spline tool. So once I create it, you can see that I sort of have a hard line and we need sort of that softness in order to get the direction to it. So what we do is that we set the size down to zero and then we increase the feather. And once we look back at the final result, we can see that we can sort of control the directionality to this. And so that is the concept of Sippler. If you look here, I've created an open spline that moves along this hair strand here. And once I enable that, you can see that I've completely removed the hair strand itself but what I do is I retain the detail from the other hair that moves along in the other direction. And that is the really powerful thing about this method. It removes the detail that moves in a certain direction, but all the detail that moves in any other direction is being maintained. And so unlike a regular frequency blur, you can retain a lot of the detail in the area that you're actually applying the blur on. So let's look at the controls of the tool. First of all, we have the iteration, and that is the number of times that the blur is being run. If you run it just once, you might get some detail still left in the image. However, once you start to apply it many times, you might get some ghosting and additional artifacts along with it being, of course, a little bit slower. So it's all about finding the good swap between those two. Next up, we have the algorithm. I'm going to go through that just in a moment. Let's take a look at detail. When you remove the detail completely, you can see that we just have a regular blur. And as we start to increase detail, we get more of that original plate detail back. Of course, if you increase it too much, you might start to get that original line back in as well, as you can see here. So it's also about like finding a good spot where you remove that, uh, but also not remove too much of the original detail. And you can think of this as sort of the length of the vector blur. Next up, we have the general blur, and that's just how much blur is being applied to the image. So sometimes you get a bit of high frequency detail and that causes a bit of artifacting like down here. So what you can do is you can use the compress feature. So what the compress feature does is that it will compress some of the high frequency detail down sort of more towards the low frequency detail. You can control the level of the compression and you can also in the advanced tab control the radius, which is kind of how big the sample area should be. In the bottom you have the soften input mask that's essentially applying a blur to the input roto node. And then you have a lock mode depending on if you want to go lock or linear. So let's take a look at the algorithms. In certain cases, you might have some high frequency details just by the thing that you want to remove. And that could potentially cause some bleeding when you have a blur size that is too high. However, if you start to reduce the blur size, you can see that we still get an outline of that hair moving across the face here. So what we can do is that we can use an other algorithm called weighted soft. And so what the weighted soft does is that it will weight the center of the stroke much smaller than the edge of the stroke. And that means that the color and luminance from the edges are prioritized much more than the center here. And so the center might completely disappear. So you can also run into a situation where you had some high frequency detail moving across the spline like this. And that would cause some ghosting. And the way that you can get around this is by using the other algorithm called cross. 
And what that would do is it will sort of apply a blur sort of perpendicular to the stroke. And so as you can see, it kind of removed all of that ghosting caused by these high frequency detail. There's also a fast version of that cross. Another thing is the selective cross that lets you define a selective threshold of how much you want to be included in the blur. Lastly, there's a weighted cross that works like the weighted soft, except that it does the perpendicular blur as well. And that's about it for Zip Blur. I hope you enjoyed. Remember to keep your brush hardness at zero, and remember to have some directionality to your strokes.